All right, everybody, welcome to webinar number seven of the Drive to Deprescribe. My name is Chad Wurz. I'm the Chief Executive for the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. Um, today's webinar is optimizing, uh, optimizing Use of Antipsychotics, part two. Uh, and we have a, a special guest with us today to walk us through some of the latest information and data on um, antipsychotics. Uh, obviously, I think to properly introduce this, we all know that, that the use of antipsychotics is scrutinized in our nursing facilities. It, that scrutinization is extending now beyond nursing homes uh, and in other settings. And certainly there are a class of medications that we focus on when it comes to medication management, optimization, and certainly potentially deprescribing. Um, so next slide. We want everybody's participation as always in these calls. They are uh, highly uh, participatory. Um, so use the chat function. I'll be monitoring the chat during um, Dr. Brandt's presentation and uh, be bringing up all, all those items and trying to answer questions for people. Next, next slide. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Optimizing Use of Antipsychotics Part 2. Uh, she is Dr. Nicole Brandt of the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. She is a professor uh, an executive director of the Peter Lamy Center for Drug Therapy and Aging. She is also a ASCP member, former president and chair of our association. So I will turn it over to Nikki. Hey, go there. Thank you, Chad, so much. Um, I'll share my screen uh, with you all. Um, and really want to thank the team here at ASCP, AMDA, and this movement of Drive to Deprescribe, something near and dear to my heart. Uh, so let me just push fast forward here to the beginning of the slides. Hopefully you can all see them okay. Thumbs up, Michael. Are they the large slides? Uh, no, uh, they're not the large slides. They are the where you can see the whole thing. Your next there we go. Slide. Is that there better? There you go. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I want you guys to see all my hidden notes here. So um, this is, it feels like giving this talk has been a culmination of experiences and activities through my career. Um, but I know we only have like a half an hour to talk because I'm told we're going to uh, stop quickly at 515. But I've been working in uh, the long-term care space for quite a period of time. And this actually is a very much, I would call it like a quick uh, recap of what we presented at the AMDA annual meeting, but with the more of the pharmacist application and some feedback from Susan Levy, I know a no stranger to you, in terms of this movement to optimize, deprescribe and reevaluate the use of antipsychotics as well as other uh, psychoactive or psychopharmacological medications. So for those of you who are at AMDA, you might have heard parts of this, um, but I've tried to revamp it a little bit to make it applicable for you when you go back to your facilities. Really excited to be presenting this with Chad, who um, as noted, have, we've been working together through the years. So I wanna just start with a patient or resident story. So this was a, a gentleman that we saw as a team um, from the inpatient then to the long-term care site. And I think it just always speaks to me when we think about patient uh, resident uh, centered care and how that really motivates what I do, at least in my policy and practice work. So this is an older gentleman hospitalized two months ago, UTI, he developed delirium during his hospital stay. He's currently at our rehab facility with the goal of going back home, multiple comorbidities. But I think what we've all become sensitized to over the last you know, 10 to 20 years is the changing demographics of the population we're caring for in long-term care, both in terms of cultural, language, race, age, comorbidities. And so um, our long-term care looks quite differently than it did in the past. And I think we've all been aware of trying to meet those resident-centered needs. So one of the things that was a little challenging for us was the language barriers that we were facing but also some of the uh, cultural uh, acceptance to medications, uh, which was the issue in this case. Prior to being in the hospital, he was 
this uh, older gentleman was not on any medications and he doesn't like to take medications. So we went literally hit the accelerator. We went from zero to what we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 medications. And we know the average number of medications when you are going from the hospital to a nursing home is about 14. So we're a little under the average, but when we go from zero to 12, um, in a person who doesn't like to take medications, it's not surprising that we get some agitation and irritability, especially when they're in an environment that's not familiar to them in a setting um, that uh, may or may not be able to meet all of their needs based on language and, and culture. So I say that because our gentleman here is on a lot of psychoactive medications. So we continue to see the headlines in our lay press about phony diagnosis, hiding high rates of drugging at nursing homes. This is a New York Times article. And then an opinion letter on the use of antipsychotic drugs in nursing homes. And I could tell you that our team rewrote uh, an editorial to combat some of the really um, misperceptions of some of these editorials. They didn't accept it. <laughs> We tried some allied um, things, but I think what it's important is that we get our voice out there as practitioners when we're looking at the work we're doing and the complexity of the population that we are caring for. Um, so that's why I just wanted to illustrate with our, our case at the beginning. So, and it's not surprising as Chad eloquently stated at the beginning that this has been a target. Um, during my tenure at CMS back in the early 2000s before even launching the CMS National Initiative in 2012, um, the use of psychoactive psychopharmacological medications have always been a target with antipsychotics and other agents. And so in 2012, uh, this partnership came out. I know you're all familiar with it, which really focused on person-centered non-pharmacological interventions for behavioral health and nursing homes. Uh, you know, the toolkits were sent out, training of surveyors happened, lots of interventions along the way to show a decrease in antipsychotic use. And this one is focusing on long long stay residents. Um, and it really has delved into regional efforts and work that's been going on. But I think all of us can agree that as we focus on one area, we may see unintended consequences that happen. So in the case of the gentleman we just spoke about, you know, we see multiple medications, not just a uh, use of an antipsychotic such as quetiapine. So uh, Dr. Maus, Donovan Maus and his team and, and Helen Kells, you may be familiar with them, have really been exploding some of the recent literature on use patterns of psychotropic medications and what might be driving some of these psychotropic medication changes. Um, so we've seen, again, this general decline of antipsychotics being used, but we've seen this increase, steadily increase of mood stabilizers uh, being utilized. And we're still seeing, you know, maybe not as much shifting in changes in some of the other concomitant medicines, um, though we have seen some recent studies saying that there's been an increase in antidepressants being used in countries like Canada to help with irritability. Um, but you'll see from some of the latter data that we already have pretty high use of many of these medications, um, such as antidepressants, which are those little uh, diamonds that you see there. Um, so it um, has been brought to the attention uh, that mood stabilizers, as we know, they're used for lots of indications. They might be used for seizure disorders. They might be being used for neuropathy. Um, in some cases, they're being used for agitation. But um, just like we talked about, you know, unclear indications before when we talk about de-prescribing, I think it's really important that we understand why we're using some of these medications and if they're really working. Um, so our team at the university uh, have been looking at the influence of the antipsychotic reduction policy. We call it the AIR, or ARP, or ARI initiative on long-term care nursing home facilities. So I'm going to just share with you just a little bit of some of our findings. Um, and it, it's quite a team uh, that consists of researchers, uh, pharmacists, and some consultants that might be familiar to you, such as Dr. Leedy, Dr. Desai, and Dr. Lucas. 
Um, and this research uh, was funded by the National Institutes on Aging. We just finished up the research and we're currently in the, the submission of manuscripts. So uh, some of this was presented uh, at some of our local meetings, uh, such as AMDA and AGS. Um, so, but I'm gonna try to give you some of the highlights and how these findings can be translated to the work that you're doing. So the intent of this work was to look at the impact of this Antipsychotic Reduction Initiative, ARI, on antipsychotic and psychopharmacological medication use patterns. Um, and I'll be sharing more of the population and facility level aspects with you today um, as we're still uh, going through the person-centered outcomes. So we used publicly available data. Um, and so we looked at claims from 2010 to 2016, and we categorized our pre-initiative as 2011 to 2012, and our post-initiative as 2012 to the end of 2016. We as you probably know, there's a little bit of a delay in getting data, and there was even more of a delay in us getting data and cleaning it up. But uh, we do now have 2017 and 2018 in-house, but when we started the study, this is what was allocated. We've worked with Brown University to look at their long-term care focus data, which gives us a different additional uh, data on staffing. Um, and I only say that because, again, this is public data that maybe some of you have used with your, with your quality improvement reporting. And then, of course, nursing home compare. So we know that the nursing home compare data has some limitations in its uh, survey uh, aspects, but we started to look at trying to operationalize some of those survey measures. So high level population, as we looked at this uh, work, we saw that antipsychotics, as well as a number of other psychological uh, psychopharmacological medication categories, um, again, antidepressants to some extent, uh, set of hypnotics, they were slightly decreasing prior to this initiative and they continued with similar slopes. There was little substitution except for anticonvulsants and mood stabilizers, showing most evidence of filling in for the antipsychotic reduction. Um, and we did see a signal looking at muscle relaxants. Not much of the literature has looked at that. Not that we're thinking muscle relaxants are being used for agitation and irritability, but it was fun as we were also looking at pain medications. So, and then just like the phony diagnosis uh, headline at the beginning, there has been emerging evidence showing some nursing facility populations inappropriately experiencing reduced antipsychotic use, including exempt um, uh, issues, bipolar disorder, and those suffering. So we saw this creep of diagnosis, but we also saw unintended consequences of those who have these diagnoses may not actually be getting the antipsychotics. So that's some of the emerging um, things that we saw with uh, our data. And so this was very similar to what's been in the public domain, but kind of some of our changes we've seen in uh, the use of uh, before the implementation of the antipsychotic uh, reduction initiative and then post the antipsychotic reduction initiative. So kind of the, the thing I think about here when I think about the clinical implications and considerations, and Chad, you can chime in if you want, is that we knew that back in 2005, 2008, the FDA added additional boxed warnings to use of antipsychotics. We've traditionally seen a decline in typical antipsychotics before, or, uh, before the atypicals came to market. Um, but we do need to be mindful of the optimization because there's been a new indications for some of these antipsychotics, as well as, um, as some of the conditions that we're seeing more often refractory depression or bipolar disorder in our population. So making sure we have a clear indication and assessment. And I know Dr. Levinson went into that. I think another thing we need to think about is, are we filling in with anticonvulsants and mood stabilizers? And is this really appropriate? There's been additional FDA safety warnings that have come out with gabapentinoids, especially when they're used in combination with opioids. Um, so are we actually putting our patient population at greater risk? Um, and it, could there be an impact on morbidity and mortality? And then as we think about our quality assurance performance improvement opportunities, you know, are we looking at those balancing measures of the use of other psychopharmacological medications when we're looking at antipsychotics? Um, and how do we hold our prescribers accountable? Because when we get into some of the facility level data, um, we need to be mindful of looking at who's prescribing these medications. So Chad, anything to your thoughts on that one with the first findings? No, I think that um, a lot of them are maybe what we would all look at our practices and, and see when it comes to 
looking at it from a medication management standpoint, I don't think many of us could argue that we've seen an uptick in anticonvulsants and mood stabilizers. Um, I don't know that the connection, you know, is always clear on why we're seeing that. Some of it may be habit. Some of it may be, um, you know, anecdotal evidence that these things are, are effective. Um, but there is always that underlying risk that it's the metric itself that might be creating the behavior that we're seeing um, in, in these population studies and the data that you're presenting. And I think that's what we have to emphasize is certainly something that we can work harder to avoid in the future and find ways to you know, adjust or reform the measurements so that we don't create the, I don't wanna call it an incentive, but basically the incentive for that kind of behavior. Correct. Um, thank you. And that's a perfect point. So again, as I think about the audience that's present with us today, thinking about how you evaluate uh, these medications and if there is substitution going on within your within the populations that you're caring for. And that's the beauty of, of looking at some of that uh, data during your QAPI meetings. All right, so I'm gonna kind of drill down to the facility level work that we've also been doing. And just a, a note in the chat, again, this is a very quick overview, um, but we are currently in submission. Um, one of our papers is under review. Uh, we've been going back and forth with rev reviewers. So um, they will be hopefully over the next couple of months, six months, nothing takes goes quickly with review though lately. Um, so just, uh, but I can share posters uh, that have been published. So the next one is facility level. And I we had subcommittees some members work on this, and this one I kind of focused on. And this probably for me as, as a clinician, trying to think about what's happening at my facility or the facilities I've worked with and you know what's happening in the bigger population basic basis of facilities. So there are some interesting findings here, maybe not entirely intuitive, um, at least when I looked at some of this, but it made me think about like what's happening in the industry. So you'll see this slide coupled with the next slide, which is more of a, a narrative. So kind of complicated. So we, we don't always see this direct relationship that we might have thought about. So before, and again, in that before the, uh, uh, the antipsychotic reduction initiative went into place that year before, uh, we saw that uh, survey ratings were seeing, good survey ratings were seeing less antipsychotic use. Um, we were seeing the presence of an NP and PA having less antipsychotic use um, and the non-white population having less antipsychotic use. Now, post antipsychotic reduction policy, the survey ratings, the, the ratings were good, but there was actually increasing antipsychotic use. And then the presence of NPs and PAs, and I'm not saying that our NPs and PAs don't know how to prescribe antipsychotics, but we're seeing more of their presence on site, and sometimes they're part of some of our psych services. So interesting to see, you know, are they getting more pressure to prescribe, but we saw some, or are they you know, we're not exactly sure. So that was an interesting finding. We also see that our population uh, non-white proportion, also an increasing signal of antipsychotic use. So it makes us think about the, the populations that we're caring for and is there equity? Um, and I know a lot of uh, focus has been going on there. Uh, psychotic disorders and dementia, uh, there was increasing antipsychotic use with the presence of this population within facilities. But like the intent of the antipsychotic reduction initiative was to reduce um, the use in individuals with dementia. But have we potentially, you know, changed the label of psychotic disorders? Have we maybe not treated the psychosis as well in this population where it's less clear? I think that's something we need to think about. Um, not so surprising, the same signal with for-profit and acuity index. Um, but the other thing I thought was interesting is the RN hours per resident per day. And when we drill down a little bit more by using the, uh, the data by uh, Brown, we actually saw what I thought was really fascinating is that antipsychotic use increased with increasing RN hour residents per day pre and post but it was unrelated to the LPN hours and it actually decreased with increasing CNA hours in resident per day. And I have to do shout out to our CNAs and, um, and the work that they do. And could they be helping us to curb the use of antipsychotics because they really know our residents. Um, so I think the staffing equation is something we need to think about and how we empower and engage all members of the team. Um, 
Another interesting signal, and again, we were looking at long stay residents, residents who were there greater than 100 years, as antipsychotic use decreased with increasing age, but the average age was not necessarily associated with the significant change between. So you asked yourself the question with increasing age, have we, you know, are we actually deprescribing? Are we reevaluating the use of these medications? So it's something to think about. Um, dual eligibility, antipsychotic use increased the proportion of residents who were duly eligible. However, the rate of change was unrelated to dual eligibility, but it gives me a signal to say, you know, are we treating the dual eligible population differently? Are we providing the services and those who have Medicare and Medicaid that they need? Um, and, you know, having provide care in different types of facilities, I can see the resources are not always equitable. So how do we think about that from an access issue? Um, so, yeah, so those are some just kind of considerations. And as we further that, you know, significant change. Again, despite this decrease in antipsychotic use, there was a significant increase in the prevalence of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, psychosis, and dementia. So we saw that kind of from our data as well um, uh, in terms of diagnoses. Um, and we talked a little bit about the staffing. So the question that gets called is, did the increase in nursing staff hours offset the need for antipsychotics in residents with higher prevalence of serious mental illness through non-pharmacological interventions? And I really think, and some researchers are starting to take a deeper dive on the increase in coexisting comorbidities such as mental illness and long-term care and, uh, and, and some of the needs that might be unique as our population changes. And I, I think back, I started my career in lockdown psychiatry facilities and group homes, you know, and, and the medication use patterns, and are we adequately equipping our team um, in long-term care when we're dealing with a population that might be changing? So, um, Chad, any thoughts on that? Um, I don't think I have anything to add to that. I think, <laughs> again, some of those some of those findings are maybe in this section, not the ones that we would have been intuitively thinking that we would find. And I think that's an important feature of this, um, especially this particular research. Yeah. Is that, um, these are somewhat counterintuitive, I think, to what you might've said at the beginning when you started looking at this information. Absolutely. And we've gone through this um, in so many, and I, I didn't get into the methods and I'm not a methods uh, guru, but I know we are, um, you know, validating some additional methodologies, but at this time of what we know with the data, with the methods we've done, um, and we've seen it in two different analytical approaches that we're seeing the same kind of signal. So I think one of the key points, I'm not going to read all of these clinical implications, but I think we need to think about sustainable care models. Um, and I applaud those of you who think outside the box in terms of looking at the provider types, staffing hours, and that collaboration um, in terms of communication, especially with some of our quality improvement um, initiatives. So I want to bring open what I perceive in terms of some of the opportunities based on the findings from our data is we are starting to see an increase in prevalence of major mental health diagnosis. When we presented this uh, work at AMDA and at AGS, it was very apparent that I think more advocacy needs to be brought to the attention of the increasing population uh, with multiple uh, potentially psychiatric conditions. Um, but are we over-diagnosing to improve facility quali quality measures like Chad alluded to, um, so which is leading to diagnostic inaccuracy. So I think really having a clear sense, and, and I know, again, the access to mental health services and long-term care is a challenge, um, but we do need to improve our behavioral health diagnosis, and we do need to think about other ways in which we treat. And our work begins to kind of uh, raise the attention to the implication of social determinants of health. Um, are we seeing a difference in prescribing? And there has been literature out there with antidepressants, for instance, and other medication classes in terms of looking at those used amongst non-white and dual eligible. And are we ensuring adequate services and education and resources amongst our facilities uh, so there isn't inequities? And then I think we need to be mindful of staffing and, you know, is it it's maybe not just an increase, but an increase in certain types um, that we need to look at. And as we increase certain types, are we ensuring that they feel adequately prepared um, to prescribe some of these complex regimens? And are there more special care units so um, to help us with uh, some of these complex behaviors that happen? Um, and I think that's important that we think about that as well. So again, 
I don't have all the answers, but I do know that each setting, each facility is different. And hopefully this will call the questions of how you look at how public health data can drive what you're doing at a facility level to not only de-prescribe, but as Chad says, optimize use of antipsychotics and other psychoactive medications. And I know that in allied work I'm doing in this space, you know, there's prescribing measures that are happening on looking at CNS burden. And I think we'll continue to bring attention. And actually one of Mao's most recent publication was looking at CNS polypharmacy. And I think that's an opportunity for us all to take pause, no pun intended here, Chad, to set you up, to take pause in how we look at the medication regimens. So honestly, more work needs to be done. We're gonna answer Q and A's at the end, but I'm gonna turn it over to Chad to talk about some of the work that he's involved with. Great. Thanks, Nikki. Um, and just a comment on, I think one thing that we, we, we don't always think about, and I think one of your bullets may be the, the tipping point of alluding to this, but we, don't, we only have a certain number of skilled nursing home beds. And, and granted, they're not all 100% occupied 100% of the time, but we do recognize that they're being occupied more frequently by people that are transitioning from hospital to home. And that those individuals that are in our nursing facilities tend to be the, the most sophisticated of the sophisticated. And I think over time, as this population grows and we have essentially 20 million more people in the over 65 age group in, in less than seven years than we do today, we're going to continue to see that. And at some point, the use of psychoactive medications and in particular antipsychotics is going to be somewhat of a J-curve because the people that might be living in those nursing facilities are going to be the people with the most advanced psychosis and the most advanced uh, behavioral issues. So I don't know that we're there yet, but I think it's interesting from your data that it's starting to sort of reflect that in some ways. Um, and that does lead into what we're doing um, with Project PAUSE. Um, if you're not familiar with Project PAUSE, and, and go ahead to the next slide, Nikki, or Aaron. Um, it is psycho, psychoactive appropriate use for safety and effectiveness. It is a project that's been led by ASCP and the Alliance for Aging Research. We also have a number of um, advocacy and professional society stakeholders, including uh, AMDA, on board with this. But it's really trying to focus CMS on reforming the antipsychotic metric. And just to, to be as simple and, and to be brief as possible, the antipsychotic metric is basically a very simple math problem. It's who's on an antipsychotic in a custodial stay, so a long stay resident, um, who's on one divided by how many people uh, are in that section, that custodial section of the nursing home. So it's very simple. They do exclude those three diagnoses of schizophrenia, Tourette's, and Huntington's. But that's been the metric since the beginning, since 2011. Um, and there's certainly things that can occur as a result of a metric that's simple that really put nursing homes in a bad position as it relates to that quality metric. If you go to the next slide, um, I'll show you some of those issues. Well, maybe the, the, the following slide. Go one more. And those disadvantages or, or inequities are if you're a very small rural facility and you have uh, let's say a few residents that are bi they have bipolar disorder and are treating, being treated with an antipsychotic, your percentage of patients in long stay on an antipsychotic might look very high compared to a larger urban facility where there's a little bit more washout of the types of patients in that facility. Um, it could also be a disadvantage based on location because, uh, again, in a rural environment, you, you are taking patients um, from a, a larger area and don't have as much ability to, to discriminate on who's in your facility. And then there's also nursing facilities that we know today that specialize in behavior management and, and, and uh, psychotic behaviors. And those facilities are certainly going to look like they have a high prevalence or frequency of antipsychotic use compared to maybe a garden variety nursing home. So there are issues in that metric that make certain nursing facilities stand out and maybe not stand out for the, for the right reasons. And it may affect their quality score ultimately it could affect their reimbursement rates. So we've um, used Project Pause to convene the stakeholders in long-term care to try to come up with a way to improve that, that metric and really put in place something that defines appropriateness. 
Um, the metric as it stands is really designed to identify inappropriate use and scrutinize inappropriate use. Uh, all of us would agree if if the patient's not appropriate for an antipsychotic, there's certainly no reason for them to be on one. But we would also agree that if a patient is appropriate for an antipsychotic, then they should be treated with the, with the correct medication. Um, and we shouldn't necessarily be at risk of, of having a negative association with that use of that antipsychotic. And even one of the questions in the chat spoke to that. Um, if I have a patient and they have paranoid schizophrenia and maybe they have a long history of that and are on an antipsychotic, it's really to their detriment if we dose reduce them or we potentially upset a medication regimen that's being effective. Um, so we have to think about that when we when we think about these metrics that we're using to to um, measure our the quality in our nursing facilities. Um, go to the next slide. So what Project Pause really aims to do is to create a scenario where the documentation that the prescriber and the consultant pharmacists are delivering on patients that have uh, antipsychotic medications on board. Um, contribute to the definition of whether or not it's appropriate or not. So um, regardless of schizophrenia Huntington's and um, Tourette's syndrome, if we do have patients that have bipolar disorder or major depressive disorder or Parkinson's disease psychosis or other conditions where there are FDA approved indications for antipsychotics, there needs to be a path where we can identify that, recognize that we know that it's being used for an appropriate use. We're measuring it from a from a quality perspective to ensure that it's it's performing for the patient, and also we're monitoring for the potential adverse effects of those medications. And that particular medication and that particular patient probably shouldn't tick as a potential negative to that nursing facility. Um, so we really are focused on that and focused on having CMS take a look at that metric to improve it. Um, in this particular iteration of what we're doing, we, we're trying to be as, as um, simple as possible with making changes to the MDS that would afford a new metric that would allow for appropriateness to play a role, um, while not making it something so burdensome that it's difficult for CMS to implement or it's difficult for um, us to implement in practice. Uh, so really, we're really trying to focus in on that documentation that in a vast majority of cases already exists in the, in the patient's medical record that could identify patients that are appropriately managed and therefore excluded from any metric on inappropriateness. Next slide. And, I think that's my last slide. Yeah, and I have to say, Chad, you know, as someone navigating public data, it would be fantastic to have a little bit more refinement in terms of the data that we could work with because there is definitely been challenges in terms of looking at the way it's reported out, both in the MDS 3.0. And I know I didn't get into the methods, but there's definitely been, in our experiences and other researchers' experience, a disconnect between the claims that are submitted, what's in the MDS, <laughs> And, and of course the medication um, uh, regimens. So, you know, having another more reliable tool to help us better understand what has happened currently or in the past would be very useful. So thank you for that. Okay, um, I think we're at the point of questions and discussions. I know the chat is getting very active. So I'm gonna to try to ca catch up to where we are. Um, I'll go back up to Dr. Valerie, who commented on the education of staff and breaking the cycle of behavior as a key to success. And um, I just want to call out that I, I, work, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Valley in the Cincinnati area. Um, so thanks for that comment. And it's good to, to see you, Dr. Valley. Um, Nicole, Nicole and Chad, can I just have put a comment in? Slash oh, button. please. Yeah. So, uh, it was interesting the data you presented and how you know we're seeing the CNAs and RNs and NPPA presence may or may not impact uh, you know that. And again, I'm just going to preach to the choir with this comment is that really, I mean, I think I think the magic does not happen by an individual being in a building, right? I mean, how did that individual interact with other inter individuals is really the key. We may have one NP in the building who may be screaming about. I really want to cut down antipsychotics, but the building is on fire with, with there's no team members there, there's no leadership. And in the end, they have nothing left. They're scared to cut down pills because they're worried about what non-pharmacologic is gonna happen in that building, uh, right? So I just wanna highlight that. Another building you may have a nurse 
who basically is an advocate for doing the right thing, but the medical director is not on board, right? The physicians just come in at eight in the morning, you know, and they don't engage in interprofessional activities and there's no real medical director activity. Well, they may be feeling alone and may not feel that they have the partnership, right? So I just want to highlight, and again, I, I understand I'll, probably everybody understands, understands this point, but I just want to highlight that what team members do in buildings together as a team, probably if we could study that, probably is going to be a way more important factor than just having and tabulating like how many people are there in that building and so forth. So that's just one comment. And the other comment, I wish like there was some way for us to look in your work, what is the impact of pharmacy consultants in the building and what is the impact of psych psychiatrist and psychiatric nurse practitioners coming in because personally I'm seeing a significant impact now with D2D because I'm focused so much on these issues. I'm seeing that when these team members get involved or are offered to be involved, then some more magic happens. And I just didn't see those disciplines in your data again, which is probably a limitation of the data you had. Yeah, Eric, thank you for that. I couldn't agree more on the constituency of the team members and the collaboration amongst the team members and most importantly, the communication, right, amongst the team members. And so that's why I just highlighted the QAPI process because it's something that's regulatorily mandated, just kind of like care planning, but I don't often see all team members actively engaged in a meaningful way, right? Um, so yeah, so I think those are really important points and they are limitations of our data. Um, and one could say that, you know, post uh, ARI, there's been more engagement of certain team members in the team. And that's why we're just seeing kind of some of the staffing changes. But the implications is it is collective. It's not just one single factor. And that's what we saw with the, the multivariate analysis is trying to tease out. And we're seeing that there's so much interplay between the, the different variables. So your, the research shows that and what you articulated from your experience shows that as well. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would just comment on that too, Nikki, mm -hmm. that I think, um, you, you know, your comments, Arif, are, are right on. I think when we look at Project Pause, and again, we're, we're trying to craft a solution that we think CMS will accept. So we're trying to make as few tweaks as possible, but at the same time, promote that collaboration. Uh, in this case, it's the, cl the collaboration between the consultant pharmacist and the prescriber, but it can't it can't happen without collaboration for the, from the other disciplines because we're asking that you know you document that if you're giving a medication for a certain set of behaviors that we're that we're getting those behaviors documented we're seeing improvement in the patient and or we're getting any adverse events documented and we're using that to inform our decisions and all of that has to the only way that happens is if we're all working together uh, in all of the different disciplines and I want to do a shout out to that in terms of working together. There's been this additional allied push in terms of culture change with age-friendly health system work and age-friendly work happening in long-term care around the four Ms. And I know there's been some comments about ensuring what matters in resident-centered care and how we get at that. So I know that that's work that the former director I worked with, Alice Bonner, has been leading with IHI and John A. Hartford Foundation. And I believe members of AMDA leadership have been involved with that work as well on a local and national level. So I just say that there's, there's other things that are trying to elevate the interprofessional nature Arif, that you articulated, but also that resident-centered care and potentially more meaningful measures. I, I know from um, working with HRSA and GWEP, they've been using MIPS measures in our ambulatory care setting to look at the quality of prescribing with relationships to 4Ms and age-friendly. So I'm hoping that these models will be more succinct, but I, I, I say that because, um, one, I should fully disclose I'm an advisor for the age-friendly movement, um, but it's really brought people working together and community communicating together. And I think we've just brought in the long-term care model. So de-prescribing, um, which you are talking about in this series, is one of the angles of focusing on what matters to patients and medications. And again, antipsychotics are just one of the high-risk medications that we bring attention to uh, as part of this movement. There's a couple questions here by Timothy, um, I think, which, you know, I have flashbacks Timothy, to when we launched this initiative back in 2012, I have to chuckle. I went into my emails and I still had when we had the original TEP um, back with this movement and we talked about measures and improving metrics and improving the, the, the patient, the resident's voice in this. And I, I would hope that there would be more outcomes looking at uh, satisfaction 
Um, so, and, you know, intrigued by that. And then the whole issue regarding consent um, in terms of not only antipsychotics, but other psychoactive medications. And that's really been a state-by-state -state basis. And I just know from the history lesson, Timothy, and maybe many of you know that as well, there's been such a strong advocacy group out of California that's really been the motivator or the driving engine behind a lot of this initiative. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I hear your voice. I don't know if there is a middle ground, but I hope there is in terms of person, resident-centered engagement and, and shared decision-making that isn't so onerous in terms of informed consent and legalities. So if others want to express their opinion there, please, please do, because I think it is a challenge that we all face. Yeah, I mean, Nikki, I would chime in. I think it's interesting from um, some of the advocacy groups and certainly from some of the legislators, the idea of informed consent seems like a simple way to solve something that they really don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that is that, yes, there, there will be families and caregivers out there that are informed and understand the antipsychotic and the use of the antipsychotic. Um, but there may be family members out there that, that, that promote the use, or maybe that was one of the medications that, that um, allowed them some relief at home and why would you be taking it away now or dose reducing it now in the nursing facility so there's there's a double edge to that informed consent and I think there's also a lack of um, understanding of what exists in the current system where there has to be um, inf it's not informed consent but there has to be communication about the start of any new medication uh, that's put on a, a patient in a nursing facility to their guardian or uh, power of attorney um, and that those conversations actually happen already. Now, do they happen to the depth that uh, maybe these groups are asking? Um, obviously not, but I think that's a that's a place to start for a middle middle ground conversation. Yeah, and I want to address Rodney's uh, uh, commentary about when you get to the lowest dose, but they do not want to stop a few behaviors now and then. You know, we had done some analyses years back looking at the signal on morbidity and mortality. And there definitely is a dose related phenomenon and a time to onset with some of these adverse effects. And, you know, one of the papers we have is a transitions paper that's going to come to press pretty soon. But, you know, signaling that maybe, you know, we're causing more harm when, especially, we have someone who's stable on a low dose, you know, potentially implied here that there might be more transitions. So there's that kind of double edged sword. So I think you as clinicians have to justify, um, you know, what every now and then is and the potential harm to that person and others around them if you stop it completely. But if they're on the lowest effective dose, they're getting efficacy and they're tolerating it. There's some emerging data saying that they that might be okay, right? It's, it's some of those new start, higher starts, multiple drugs at the same time, but looking at some of those dose-related phenomenons. And so that's why we've been focusing some of our efforts on you know, low dose, standard dose, and high dose. And, um, and so there's been a sophistication in that literature, um, also in terms of time of onset of when, when, when individuals are starting those medications, some of the greatest risk windows. Um, so yeah, great question. Chad, this is Michael. Is there anything that participants in the D2D who, who come to our webinars every month uh, can do to support um, the project pause? Or is this something you guys are running with and you just need us to have your backs? <laughs> um, I think for, for now, we need, we need you to have our backs. Um, we are, like I mentioned, both AMDA and ASCP are very active on Project Pause. There will come a time when we will need research and um, even if it's anecdotal information to be able to share with CMS uh, on why these things are important. Um, it, it's really right now, it's, it's in that white space of between CMS and legislation. And, and what I mean by that is initially, a couple of years ago when we started Project Pause, CMS was like, no, we're not changing it. And they were just very matter of fact, we're not changing it. Obviously, there's been some changes in, in the people that are at the head of CMS. Um, so there's been some time that's gone on. We've, we've endured a pandemic. Um, we've also been working with legislators who are also very uh, keen to this, to this uh, issue and, and put a lot of attention on it. And we've been able to work with them on what we think good solutions are. And what that ends up doing is that ends up threatening CMS that do I want to do this because Congress passed a law and told me to, or do I want to go back and work with the people that are trying to get 
good reform done. So they've they've come back to the table in a way that um, is a little bit more uh, collaborative from our perspective. And that's kind of the game that we're playing right now is moving between the legislators that want to see things get done and CMS that is now seemingly open uh, to looking at measure reform and trying to come up with some answers. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, Michael, I don't think we're going to need a hook. I think we ended right on time at 515. I think we answered all of the chat comments and uh, we're no stranger to AMDA. And so feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments. But I think you guys have some closing remarks. So I will screen ahead here in terms of some housekeeping aspects. Okay, um, this is the deprescribing spearhead group, uh, which is an opportunity to recognize high performing post acute long term care centers. Um, please contact the DDD team through the form below if you want to share any of your deprescribing success stories and strategies. Um, and that, you know, obviously certainly includes what we talked about today. So even a, a better answer maybe to Michael's question on how to share information that can then influence these policies and, and certainly influence the practices of, of your peers. Next slide. And our next D2D &D progress update and webinar is July 21st at 4.30. That will be a progress update on all of the activity that you all have been putting in on D2D. &D. And then August 18th, we will have another D2D uh, &D webinar again at 4.30. So I don't know if I'm signing everybody out. I'll, uh, I will do that. Thank you for listening today. Nikki, thank you for being here and presenting. Thank you. Uh, the DDD. Uh, thank community. you, Nikki. Really appreciate you joining us. And thank you, Chad, for facilitating today. Yep. And thanks to all the um, AMDA people behind the scenes that make these productions work. So appreciate all of them as well. Absolutely. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.